and you look for the mobility of the in the subretinal space. So when you have mobile subretinal ecos, it is characteristic of cholesterol, it is characteristic of something that is moving in the subretinal space, so very, very likely you're dealing with post disease. Having said that, this is the most common misdiagnosis that we make. And I guess everybody here has had a case where you were not able to differentiate between the codes and in retinoblastoma, landed up in you creating an eye with codes, thinking it was RB. But that's fine. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. That's, yes. that's success. <laughs> sometimes FKA and post disease is actually in the area of the vascular record. Sometimes you see uh, uh, the vessels being connected to each other, you see telangiectatic bulbs. So FFA does help in post disease in differentiating it from metal dust The gas, what do you think the pathogenesis or etiology of codes is? So far it is idiopathic, but there is a genetic basis. People believe that there's a hedge of pathway that gets disrupted in Coates disease. Yeah. We have some genetics about Coates disease. After it was discovered that there is a genetic defect called the cerebral retinal microangiopathy mm -hmm. calcification census, that is from mutation in the CPC1 gene. And in about 20% of Coates disease we find a heterozygous mutation in this okay. disease, yes. whereas the full disease is caused by a compound heterozygous mutation. And this is mutation in the blood? Sorry? Can you look for mutation in blood? Mm -hmm. Or? Yeah, it's a uh, standard case of Cox's disease, and typically it's. So with those being familial? No. But if they all carry that mutation? But it must be affected by other diseases. <coughs> we also know from the carrier parents of children with CRMCC that very occasionally they show a vascular abnormality in one eye. So probably most who have a, a heterozygous mutation in CTC but have normalized, but occasionally they will have a post disease. So, so maybe the rest of codes, the 80% that don't carry this mutation maybe in blood, a maybe mutation. it's a somatic mutation yes. of the same gene. Yes. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. or, or mosaic or something. Exactly. Very interesting. But there's another hypothesis, the Norian hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned this. Yeah. yeah, and then they have the memory of the memory of the memory that's all. In terms of pathogenesis, I, I think it's an AV shunt. And often in these eyes, when you have not full detachment, when you have much less for advanced Coates disease, if you look in the far periphery, you can see it in a circular vessels as AV shunts at the very early yeah. stages. Interestingly, in the CRMCC also there is a complete vascularity of the periphery, yes. often with yes, that's what circular vessels. Yes, yes. So I think the pathogenesis but, is a vascular effect. in spite of the wine. Right, 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 right. No, but is the <coughs> AV shunting secondary to the pathology or is the pathology giving rise to the AV shunting? There is a pathology in the eye and you have the vascular resonance. So to compensate for that, the AV uh, malformation happens. But, but not there. This is not secondary. I don't think. I think that that retina never had an acetylene. And the vessels that I preserve in much less detail, um, much less advanced disease, there'd be a circular vessel that you could see going around as a early shunt vessel, and you can show it's shunting. So, this is how Coates disease is classified, and in the early stages we have good treatment, we can save these lines with its excellent vision. But when the disease advances, then it becomes really difficult, and sometimes it, when the eye becomes painful, we do have to immediate some of the eyes. Sorry to interrupt you again. With excellent vision, one of the very early signs is macular exudate. In the early stages, yes. Macular exudation now with treatment, it takes a little while, but they do go away over a period of time. So if you treat your telangiectasias in the periphery and treat your vascular retina, 
over a period of a year or two, there is a tendency for the macular exhibition to actually go away. But if they present with a macular scar, like macular cyst or a macular scar, then the vision is poor. There is also an interesting feature of Crohn's disease because you mentioned the, this uh, stage two uh, with uh, northern detachment at several uh, limits and two A and two B, two A four we are intact, two B four we are with the uh, stellates or uh, sub uh, four uh, infiltration with limits. But there is actually uh, another. Uh, Presentation, which is the nodular, the nodular, uh, what, what I call the uh, uh, nodular maculopathy, of course, which can actually uh, present almost like a little tumor in the macula. And <coughs> if you take all the patients with uh, less than uh, 3A, all the coach patients with less than 3A stages, it's like 40% of the patients will present with a nodular maculopathy. When you have the nodular maculopathy, you never recover yeah, the vision okay. because the macula is yes, destroyed. Yes, Whereas when there is no nodule, yeah. as you said, the lipids go away. <coughs> if you apply MDO, MDO treatment, mm -hmm. they will recover the vision. Sometimes almost normal vision, I must say. But it takes a little while. You have to wait for a year or two for the lipids to actually get. It's, it's why we, we, we proposed a new subdivision of 2B, 2B1 and 2B2, because it's predicting of, of, of the vision outcome. It's predicting of the vision outcome. And uh, so we, the paper is just outcome. The retina. Good. 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 And that's the place where OCT yeah. will make a huge yeah. difference yeah. to understanding and treatment.
Yes. Yeah. So this is, if you're thinking this as a right now or anything in the future is digital, it is very, very clear for you to actually see. And from this part of the, and you can actually see the this as well. So it's your view of that. What do you see on top? The back flow in the back flow in the because it's persistent hyperplastic AG. Or if there is an angiography, you have, uh, if you can access the. You can see the Yeah. The next is optical taxis proxocarases. It's again, it could be of, it can present in three different ways inside the eye. It could present as an endogenous abdominitis. It can present as posterior pool granuloma or peripheral granuloma. And the damage here is basically because of the host response to the infection. So, if you have seen in older children, usually unilateral, there's a history of soil ingestion, exposure to puppies, and there is organizing vitreous contraction between the tashu. And the sound shows the involvement of the vitreous, but there's absence of tashu. This is a separate granuloma in the posterior pole, but you could also have something in the periphery, a peripheral granuloma, and you have a traction lesion up to the disc. Advanced ROP, not so difficult to differentiate because usually you have a very good history, so you have a history of prematurity, low birth weight, and you have his, uh, history of exposure to oxygen. When you do an ultrasound in an ROP to make a decision whether you want to operate on a child with stage 5 ROP or not, again, you've got to look at the peripheral looping and you also look at what you see in the cervical space. So if you see a lot of mobility in the cervical space, then very likely you're dealing with a case of ROP with crystals, the child is not going to do well. And if this loop extends very far in the periphery, then the intersection is going to be very, very difficult. So these are such good decisions that one can take looking at the ultrasound to the child in the child. As to cytoma, Dr. David McKay talked about this yesterday. <coughs> these are flat deteriorations. <coughs> Usually seen in children, they come to us flat being diagnosed tuberous sclerosis or new fibromatosis to rule out lesions in the retina. They are flat tubers seen on the retinal surface and can give rise to a bite of flex. When you have toxoplasmosis, again, when you have a scar in the macula that eats away the overall and the retina, leaving behind bare sclera, it can give rise to leukopolia. And it's a congenital infection. You pick up and you treat these children, though they do not have that. The vision is gone, but you prevent further recurrences of the infection. Optic colloboma again. Because of the coloboma, there is a defect of the retina or PE. It's not present, it's a developmental anomaly. But here, usually again, it's bilateral, seen in both eyes. There are other things that you look for, like presence of iris coloboma and fungal changes. And this is given, you will prove that you're not dealing with your customer, but it is a coloboma. So that's all about the coloboma. And this is an app that all of you can download. It's available both on iPhone and uh, Android-based phones, or it's free. When you download the app and you uh, use this app, it looks at all the pictures in your mobile phone, and if you take out all those pictures that have abnormal reflex. So anything that shows abnormal reflex in the fundus, you can actually pick up using this app. So something that can be used by people. Is there data on its use and what comedy it detects that there have to be meaningful problems? <clears throat> but I mean, it's, it's, I don't think many patients are using it. It's just ordinary. We are getting used to so maybe we can inform the GPs and others to you know, ask parents to download it and have it. I really don't know how this will be applicable. Yeah. But this is something that can detect the presence of the abnormal in the Does that have a uh, question about the diagnosis? Uh, if you are not so sure about the diagnosis, for the like the typical uh, cases, where you do the final uh, biopsy, 
biopsy? Absolutely, actually no. If I need a spiritual biopsy, if your diagnosis is towards retroblastoma, more towards that, you would never want to invade an eye and do a biopsy. I agree. Yes. <laughs> So moving on to the next part, classification of retinoblastoma. Just a brief background, we have the recent expert classification, uh, which actually group ties based on the external response to external B radiation therapy, which was the modality of treatment at that point of time. In 2003, we had the international intraocular retinoblastoma classification led by Ed Murphy, and it divided the eyes from A to E based on systemic chemotherapy and the response of eyes to systemic chemotherapy, which was the, modality, the commonest modality of treatment at that point. So this is a slide actually where from I borrowed from Dr. <coughs> during his presentation in this lab. And so group A eyes, you have small tumors restricted to the retina, but away from the triple structure. So they are away from this and macula. Then you have Larger tumors, more than 3 millimeters, but in the different structures, still confined with the retina, it becomes root B. In IIRC, you had local, localized vitreous seeds, it was group C. When you had diffused vitreous seeds, it became group D. And when it was, the eye was completely destroyed by the tumor, it was group B. <coughs> but there was a big Controversy because in 2005 we adopted the IIRC classification and then we had the ICUR or the ICRB in 2006. And a lot of papers were being published on the ICRB classification and people were actually thinking we're talking about IIRC classification. So, why an eye like this? When you have a total retinal attachment, you have some proceeding, you have a big mass. So, do you call it as D or do you call it as an E? By the sheets. It must be the E for Yes. So, but it's greater than 50%. But now, you know, in the TNR, it's a PT2. Yes. No, P2. It's a P, no, it's a P. It's OB. 2B. Yes. And the other extreme of the 2B is the C. Yes. Presented in yes. The yes. 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 Using one classification system versus the other, the D and the IE eyes would behave differently. For one publication, you will have the eyes with 60% success, 70% success. But when you analyze your own data, you would find that you don't have the same success. So that was basically because people were using these two classification systems interchangeably. And at that point, we had the international staging system. So you had to group the eye and you had to stage the patient. And again, there were a lot of flaws in this staging system as well. So what if you start treating the patient conservatively and he has a failure of treatment and then requires a new patient? So do you upgrade the patient from stage 0 to stage 1, which is not allowed in any staging system in other cancers of the body? You call it as progressive disease and you stop there, but here do you upgrade it from stage 0 to stage 1 or to stage 2, depending on the pathology? So there were issues with the international staging system as well. And that's when came the seventh edition of AJCC and where we included the DNM classification system. But this wasn't complete as well. There were flaws in the seventh edition of AJCC system as well. And that is why we now have the eighth edition, about which Dr. Gali has spoken extensively yesterday. And I'll just deal with it in a bit. So you have the CTNL, which is the <coughs> classification, and a PTNL, which is the pathological classification. So for tumor, T0 is there's no evidence, and you go from T1, T2, T3, and T4. It is T4 when you have 
extraocular tumor detected by imaging studies. So if you have T1A, this is again group A. T1A is tumors away from the critical structures. <coughs> so T1A is there's tumor away from the critical structures. T1B is group B of the IARC system. You have tumors, there are no seeds, but you have tumor in the within the different structures, more than 3 millimeters. T3B is when you have, oops, next slide is So when you have one or more complications like neovascular glaucoma, tumor extension into the anterior segment, high thema, vitreous hemorrhage, or optical like this. And T4 is when you have extraocular tumor detected on imaging studies, like invasion of the optic nerve and tumor into the organ. And this is where the T4 came in. So extraocular disease is T4. <coughs> in the nodes, we have no palpable nodes, and CN1 is where you have pre-auditor, submandibular, or cervical nodes. Okay. No metastasis versus metastasis on imaging, that is distant sites versus CNS, that is A and B. And this is the most important aspect of the classification system. Retroblastoma is the first tumor where you have edge, that is very good trait, incorporated in the classification system now. <coughs> so you have H0 where there is no other mutation detected or you do not have any information about the heredity. H1 is where you have, as cases of bilateral retroblastoma, where you have confirmed constitution having one mutation in the uh, patient, a family is to get the blastoma or a child with trilateral the blastoma. Yes. How is this the case? If you don't know the genetics, it's not unequivocal. We were discussing it over the breakfast. In Finland, we have one family, and in Australia, two families in which there are two independent retinoblastomas that are genetically different. How, how far apart are they? Uh, uh, two generations apart. Yes, so we've had several like that. Mm -hmm. We, we, we sure they're not related. Yes. So what we should have in the family, family history, it should be uh, first or second degree relative. Exactly. You know, or, or in the absence of the genetic information. Yes. we have yes. exactly similar yes. distances yes. in yes. low penetrance cases. Yes. You wouldn't yes. recognize this two from the pedigree. Yes. Yes. <coughs> and we have heard about the technological classification. Could I just back you up on this? Yes. Because way back you had the first slide on this, the 8th edition, I think you said, um, further back. Numbers no more than two thirds the volume of the eye. No, this, is, this is the 7th edition. Okay, so, yeah. okay, because that's not in there. Yes. There's no, no yes. volume of the yes. tumor is in there. <coughs> You don't need to. You don't need to. It's only the ovic period that that's ancient history. You don't need to determine the percentage of volume of the tumor. In fact, and the data supports that there, it doesn't make much difference. Big tumors might respond very well. In fact, if you see the two international classifications, also closely, in the IARC there was only there was only for stage a group A and B that we talked about the tumor size, and not beyond that. But if you look at the ICRB, they do talk about yeah, they do talk about tumor size later again. And like Dr. Gary showed in the presentation, the size of the tumor does not matter. And what is important for us, the data that is required <coughs> for clinical staging. So we should have radiological imaging, wherever possible MRI scan. MRIs are important for us to look for extraocular extension and to also look for primary neurotubular tumor for us to be able to stage the patient. It is important that we have baseline investigations done. Yeah, you said that you require CT, but they never do a CT yeah. to avoid the radiation. No, there, are, there are some centers that I know of are still doing CT scans. I just put it, put it there. But we wouldn't but, recommend that. Yeah, we don't recommend that. We don't no. recommend so but some may be still out of date thinking you can't tell if there's calcium there, but, that, yes. but you don't no. need the CT scan to know if there's calcium there. Yeah. Yeah. And during 
examination and anesthesia, these are things that we look for, intraocular pressure, or something called diameter, and, and some of the things that I have mentioned, like, you know, in the imaging, calcium, angiography, and OCT, and you know, I was with John, and he had a list of 45 on the day. So is it practical for all of us, you know, that I, I've been to 13, 14 centers all across the world, centers that see two or three cases in a day, versus centers that see 40 cases, and there was a time I was doing 35 EUAs in a day, and without realizing I would hold the red cam the entire day, and I developed a frozen shoulder. I had to undergo a surgery. I didn't realize, I mean, these are what <coughs> And if you spend time in every single child, in imaging, in OCT, trying to look for subclinical and detectable disease, I don't know how practical it is, in centers with high volume, and whether that really has a role to play. So, I mean, I would like your... No, no, I agree, of course. You know, I think you have to, to uh, realize the context in which uh, the management is, is performed. So, obviously, uh, if you have 40 patients to see a day, you cannot go into much details. So you have to to deal with uh, you know the important features and you can you know, lose time on trying to detect you know the subtle things that can really show up at the next visit. So uh, but, uh, you know, for, for us in Switzerland, you know, it's for small country, small volumes, so we tend to investigate them extensively. We typically see 10 patients a day. So you know it's a very common but uh, it's, it gives us enough, enough time to go in and do it. Mm -hmm. Of course, in my own do if I think about another diagnosis, I'm not going for it to be very different from it. And the only thing is most useful is confirming something that is suspicious and you are unsure about. It's not uh, just to look for something that you don't see without those disease. So in, in my experience watching um, retinal blastoma at EUAs in China, they are exceedingly well done and I don't think there's anything missed. I think we, we have the luxury of all these imaging tools that we want to test and look at, so, but I don't think the ultimate patient outcome is to be on them at all. <laughs> That's right. So, so I think that the ret cam is really important you can compare what was there and seeing the OCT is not critical. But I would add the UBS on the list because some, all the time it is like the OCT, I don't do OCT on all the patients and I don't do a uh, few OCT on all the patients. But UBS sometimes is extremely... UBS is when you're trying to plan a decision for interpreting injection or...
there are things that have been missed, there are things that have not been added, there is room for change because you will have the night position coming in a couple of years, so you, you can add or delete something that, not, that is there. And most of the peer review journals from now on will probably uh, enforce us to use the TNMH classification system. Thank you so much.